Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to our lecture series on strength of materials. Kindly subscribe, like, share, and leave your comments and suggestions as well. Today, we are looking at beams, shear force, and bending moments. So let's see what we have for today on our lecture series. Good. We are looking at beams. When we talk about beams, we are referring to slender members that support loadings applied perpendicular to them. So for example, this is a slender member. So let's take it that we have a support at this side. We have a support at this side. And then we have another support at this side. And we apply forces perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of this bar. So now this slender member is supporting this perpendicular forces applied to it. And so this is what, what we have here is what we refer to as beam. So we say that beams are slender members that are used to support loadings applied perpendicular to longitudinal axis. Beams are one of the most important engineering structural members. They are one of the most important, important engineering structural members. And they are used in variety of ways. For example, they are used to strengthen the floor of buildings, the floor of buildings. They are used there. Also, they are used in bridges, in the construction of bridges. They are used to strengthen the wings of aircraft, the wings of aircraft. The wings of aircraft. And also the boom of a crane, boom, the boom of a crane also, they use beams to support the structure. And also in automobiles, the axle of automobiles, of automobiles, also they use beams to support them. Now, Anytime you apply loadings on a beam, anytime you apply loadings on a beam, because of the applied load, because of the applied load, sharing effect is produced on the beam. Not only sharing effect, but also moments. Bending moment take place. So what we are saying is that this force will either cut this plane. This. There are two things which happens with this force which is applied on the beam. The first one is it tries to cut through this beam and also it tries to bend the beam. So there are two important things which happens anytime load or a beam is loaded. The first one is sharing effects. And then the second one is bending, bending moment. And the sharing effect causes shear stresses in the member, shear stresses in the member, whereas the bending effect or the bending moment induces normal stresses, normal stresses. in the member, and this is normal stress in the member. Now this shear stress and this normal stress distribution on the beam varies along the length of the beam. So we don't have a uniform distribution depending on the position on the beam. 
an object is going to have a different shear stress or a different normal stress or a different shear force and a different bending moment. So we are saying that it varies, both the shear force and the bending moment varies along the length of the beam. Therefore, in, in the design of beams, because we are saying that the distribution of the shear force and the bending moment varies from one point to another. There is the need for the designer to determine where the maximum sharing stress or the maximum shear force, the maximum shear force and the maximum, the maximum shear force and the maximum. and the maximum bending moment of heads. And that will help the engineer to design to be able to reduce or withstand failure. Now let's look at type of beams. Let's look at type of beams quickly. Good. Size of beams. Beams are classified according to the supports. So depending on the supports which the beam have, beams can be classified. So basically, there are two broad categories of beams. We have one statically determinate beam, statically, statically determinate beams. Determinate. And then we have the second portion to be statically indeterminate. Statically indeterminate. So these are the two main types of beam indeterminate. Good. When we say that a beam is statically determinate, don't forget that in mechanics, we say that the equilibrium equations for two-dimensional objects are three. Sum of f of s is equal to zero, sum of f of y is equal to zero, and sum of moment about any point is also equal to zero. These are the three equilibrium equations. And because we have three equilibrium equations, they can only be solved for three unknowns. Therefore, anytime you have a beam which has a maximum of three unknowns, then the beam is statically determinate. In the other way around, if you have more than three unknowns, then it means that the number of equations are not sufficient to solve such kind of problem. And therefore, we refer to it as statically indeterminate. And you cannot be able to determine the reactions by only statics. Now, looking at statically, now looking at statically indeterminate beams, let us look at the types and the statically indeterminate. First, we have what we refer to as so the first one under this type is called simple beams. It's called simple. Beams. Now, when we talk about simple beams, we are talking ab about a beam which has a pin support at one end, a pin support at one end, and then it also has a ruler support at the other end, at the other end. at the other end. So a simple beam is like this. We have one at this end. So this one is a pin support. And then we have one at the other end, which is a ruler support at the ends of the bar, at the ends of the bar. So one end and another end. 
then we call it a simple beam. And if you draw the free body diagram for this, you find out that your free body diagram is going to look like this. Because this is a pin support, there will be two reactions. One in the X is to prevent motion in two directions. So one in the X, if this is A, and this side is B, then we can refer to this as AX. And then we can also refer to this side as the A, A, Y. A, Y, because it's a pin support, it will resist motion in both the X axis and in the Y axis. But this one is a ruler. Looking at this orientation, it can allow us to move in the X axis. Therefore, the reaction is always at the side which motion is prevented. Therefore, our reaction will be Y, so we can get dy. So from here, you can see that we have a maximum of three unknowns. A maximum of three unknowns. Therefore, it is statically determinate. Another type of statically determinate is number two, what we refer to as a cantilever. A cantilever. When we talk about a cantilever, we also refer to it as built in. Built in. Built in. It is also referred to as built in or fixed in. So now, in this kind of beam, we have a support that the beam is fixed at one end. It is fixed. It is fixed at one end, it is fixed at one end in a solid wall, in a solid wall. Then we refer to that as a cantilever. So this is an example of a cantilever. So this is the wall and you can see that it is embedded in the wall like that. So if this is A, this side is B, one end is fixed and because it is in the wall, it will resist motion in the X. The free body diagram will look like this. It will resist motion in the X. It will not allow you. It will also resist motion in the Y, and it will also resist rotational motion. So we have the X. We have the Y, and then we have M X or M A. So you can see that here also we have three unknowns, one, two, three, and therefore it is statically determinate. And the last example under statically determinate is what we refer to as overhang, overhang beam, overhang beam. Now, the difference between overhang beam and simple beam is that for overhang beam, the free the ends are free, so the supports are rather in the middle. The pin support and the ruler support are rather in the middle, and the ends are free. So either both ends are free or one of them is free. Then in that case, we have an overhang. So like this. In this case, only one end is free, but in that case, both ends are free. So that is referred to as overhang beam. And this is also statically determined because we have you have two, one reaction for the rocker and one other reaction for the pin support. So that is for statically determined. Let's look at statically indeterminate. Example of statically indeterminate beams. Example of statically indeterminate beams. So for statically indeterminate, sorry, allow me to clean this. For statically indeterminate beams, Statically indeterminate. For statically indeterminate beams, it means that we have already established the fact that 
Statically indeterminate has more than three reactions at the support. So number one, under statically indeterminate is supported cantilever. A supported cantilever is like this. One end is fixed in a, a wall, as we saw in the cantilever. And we also have another support at this side. So from here, if you draw the free body diagram, you find out that this side, the one which is fixed in the wall, resists motion in the Y. It also resists motion in the X, and it also prevents rotational motion. And this one, which is a pin support, also have reaction in the Y and reaction in the X. Therefore, we have five reactions to be determined with three equations. And that is not possible. That is why we refer to it as statically indeterminate. Another type of the statically indeterminate is what we refer to as continuous, continuous beam over more than continuous beam over more than two parts. Continuous beam with more than two supports, with more than two supports. So in that case, you can have a beam like this, and to have a support here, this one is a, a, a pin support. We have another one here is a rocker. We have another one here is a rocker. So when you try to draw the free diagram, the free body diagram for this, you are going to get your structure like this. There is two reactions here. There is one reaction there. There's another one reaction there. And this is giving us four reactions and you have three equations to solve. Therefore, it is referred to as statically indeterminate bar. Now let's look at, we have looked at types of beams. Now let's also look at type of loads on beams, types of loads which can be applied on beams, types of loads which can be applied on beams. Good. So the first one we are looking at under the types of loads which can be applied to beams is what we refer to as constant, concentrated Concentrated or point load. Concentrated or point load. So when we talk about concentrated or point load, it means that we have the beam, we have a support. Let's take it that these are the supports. One is a ruler, the other one is a pin. And We refer to it as a concentrated load or point load because the load is just acting at a single point. The load acts on only a single point. So when we have forces like this, we refer to it as a concentrated load or a point load. And because it's just a single point, the unit is Newton or kilonewton. Then the second type is what we refer to as Distributed load. Distributed load. So for distributed load, it means that the load acts continuously over a distance. In distributed load, the load acts continuously over a distance over a distance. And we have two types of distributed load. The first one is uniformly, uniformly distributed load. Uniformly distributed load. And when we talk about the uniformly distributed load, if I have a beam like this, and I have the supports, and I have forces which are uniformly distributed like this. 
all over, or it can be portions of the beam. So when I have this, like this, then we refer to it as a uniformly distributed load. So each of them, or the intensity of each of them is given as Q, and the unit is Newton per meter, or it can be kilonewton per meter. Or the unit can be in the S in the US system, it will be pounds per feet. So that is for a uniformly distributed load. We also have the second type, type B, which is called the non. So what we talk about before we go to the non-uniform, when we talk about the uniform distributed load, it has a constant intensity along the length. They act. So it has a constant, constant intensity. Intensity along the length, along the length. So what that means is that at every point in time, every point along those distributed loads will have the same intensity. But that is not the same for non-uniform non-uniform distributed loads. The non-distributed loads, non-uniform, non-uniform distributed non-uniform distributed load is for non-uniform distributed load, the intensity of the load is not constant. So we can say that the intensity varies, the intensity varies along the length. It varies along the length. It varies along the length. So from here we let us look at the diagram of non-uniformly distributed structure. So we have this, we have our supports like that. In that case, non-uniform, non-uniform, our structure will look like this. So the load keeps on increasing from one point to another along the length of the beam. Yeah, so anytime you have a distribution of the force like this, Load so is a is a distributed load, but this distribution is not uniform. So this is referred to as non-uniform distribution. Good. So from there now, let's go. Let's quickly go to bending and shear force diagrams. Bending and shear force diagrams. Good. We, it has already been established in our earlier slide that when we have a beam which is loaded, a beam which is loaded, the applied load causes sharing effects and bending effect on the back. And we are saying that the sharing effect is as a result of a shear force created internally in the structure. So when I cut through this side, when I cut, when I cut through this side, you find out that there will be a shear force developed internally within the structure and it is denoted with B and also there will be a moment In there denoted with M. 
we are saying that this shell force and this movement varies along the length of the, the beam. And we stated that for you to design the beam to perform the task which you are intended for, there is a need for you to determine the maximum shear force, the maximum shear force. And then you also need to determine the maximum bending moment and where they occur. You need to determine their magnitude and where they occur so that it can help you to predict how the structure is going to fail. And this is very significant in design. Therefore, because it varies along the length of the material, we can say that the distribution is a function of x or a function of the length of the length. So a graph, a graphical representation which tells us how the function is distributed is what we refer to as the shear force and bending moment diagram. So the bending moment diagram is a graphical representation of how the shear force and the bending moment are distributed along the length of the beam. So we are, that is what we are going to do most often in this session. But before we look at how to draw the bending and shear force diagram, let us look at our sign convention. Sign convention. Sign convention. So we are going to assume that any force which acts upwards is positive. So these forces are acting upwards, it's moving upwards. So such forces are positive. And then any force which points downwards is going to assume to be negative. So that is for force, the external forces and reactions are support. Let's look at the shear force, the internal shear force, the internal shear force, which is in the member, which is in the member. So for the internal shear force, if I cut through this session, I'm going to get two halves like that and two halves like that. Therefore, the internal shear force is going to be like this. And to every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. So if this side is pointing downwards, then this side is going to point upwards. Now you can see that from this, you realize that from the principle of transmissibility, if I apply this force which I have here, which is the shear force at this side of the beam, and this is the end, it's going to cause the bar to rotate in the clockwise direction. In the same way, when I apply the force there, the force at this side here, to the beam, sorry, to the beam, like this, it is also going to cause, looking at the direction when I apply it this way, and this is where it is supposed to rotate, it is going to cause the object to rotate in this direction, which is also clockwise rotation. So when you have this pair of forces, which is causing clockwise rotation of the body, then such pair is called a positive shear force. It's a positive shear force. The opposite is true. When the, the pair is causing anti-clockwise rotation, then it means that it is going to be negative. So if this is acting upwards like this, and this is acting downwards, now it is going to cause anti-clockwise rotation, anti-clockwise, anti-clockwise. And therefore, this shear force here, if this, this side is up and this side is down, then it is a negative, is a negative shear force. 
It's a negative share force. It's a negative share force. In the same manner, we can also deduce the sign convention for bending moment. We can deduce the sign convention for bending moment. For bending moment, anytime you have the structure like this, so we said that when you cut through, there is going to be some bending. So in this case, we are looking at bending movement. So we have a movement in this direction and a movement in that direction. Now you can see the direction of the two moments. You can see that this one is compressing the top fibers of the bar here. And this one is also compressing the top of the fibers here. The top of the fibers, the top of the fibers. So when you have that, then we say that that is a positive bending moment. This is positive. The opposite is also true. When you have a bending moment, which is rather compressing the down or the bottom part or the bottom fibers like this, compressing the bottom fibers, then it is going to be a negative. It is going to be a negative share, negative shares, negative bending moment. Sorry, negative bending moment. Good. So we are going to apply these sign conventions in our analysis. So quickly, let us look at how to analyze or how to draw share force and bending moment diagram. Let us look at how to do that quickly, and then we solve an example on that. Then we bring our lecture for today to an end. So let's see how to draw a shear force diagram. So the procedure, the first thing you need to do is to draw a free body diagram. So number one, you draw a free body diagram, a free body diagram of the entire structure or of the beam you have been given of the beam you have been given and number two you determine the reactions at the support you determine the reactions at the support at support and how do you determine the reactions at the support? By using the equilibrium equation, f of x, sum of f of x is equal to zero, sum of f of y is equal to zero, sum of moment about a point is equal to zero. Then the third one is, once you are able to do that, to indicate, you specify, the x axis and your origin. Specify the x axis and the origin. And the origin. So basically, your origin is very important. And always, your origin should be at the left of the beam, the left, far left of the beam. So your origin is going to always be at this portion. This is where you start your analysis from, from the far left. And this is your x axis. This is your x axis. So your origin is this. And then number four, what you need to do is to divide the beam into sections according to the points with discontinuity. So divide the beam into sections. Divide the beam into sections. Into Sections. Divide the beam into sections and you divide into sections according to the points of continuity. Points of continuity. So, where does these points of continuity take place? Anytime you encounter a new force, there is a point of discontinuity. We said that you start from the far left. So in this case, if I have a force here, another force there, 
another post at this point. Then once I move to this point, I've encountered the post. So there's a discontinuity. Once I come to this side, there's a continuity. Once I encounter another post, there's a discontinuity. So this will be session one, session two, session three. So you divide into sections. And once you are divided into sessions, the fifth thing is to draw a free body diagram of each of the sessions and you determine the internal shelf force and the bending moment. So like this, we just pick session one. And let's say that there's a force here. If there's a force here, you pick session one. Session one is from this point to that point. So it means that this force will not come in your analysis. It is only from this point up to this point. And we determine the internal shear force and the internal bending moment, the internal bending moment. So you determine for all the various sessions. So that is the four point. Draw the free body diagram. Body diagram. And determine determine the shear force, the shear force, and bending moment, internal shear force. Take note of that they are internal in that session. So internal shear force and bending moment for each of the sessions, for each of the sessions. Each of the sessions. For each of the sessions. And how do you determine the shear force? So the shear force is obtained by summing all the perpendicular forces. The shear force is obtained by summing forces perpendicular to the beam axis. So shear force is obtained by summing all perpendicular, perpendicular forces to the axis. Forces to the axis. the axis. Then how do you determine the moment number seven? The moment is obtained by determining so the bending moment. The bending moment is obtained by summing moments about the sectional end of the segment. The bending moment is obtained by summing moments about the end of the session. Summing moments about the session end of the, uh, the session end of the segment. So it means that you will take moment at the point which you divided your structure. So you take moment at this point, moment at that point, and moment at that point. So at the point where a session is ending, is where you take the moment from. Now you have determined your shear force and your bending moment. What are you going to do next in your analysis? So let's see how to go about that. Now that you have determined your shear force and your bending moment, you are now going to draw your diagram. You are now going to draw your diagram. So how do you draw your diagram? Number one, for the shear force, you plot the shear force to so number seven. You plot the shear force. So the shear force on the vertical, you plot the shear force on the vertical, and then the length of the beam on the horizontal.
And this diagram is drawn below the three body diagram. Take note of that. Draw it before the added to be draw it below the free body diagram. So this will be our X. And positive values of the shell force will be up here, whereas negative values will be below the X axis, will be below the X axis. And number eight, how do we draw the bending moment? It is also drawn below the free body diagram after the shell force. And the vertical will be the bending moment, the bending moment, which is M. And the horizontal is going to be the length of the beam. And again, the positive values of the bending moment will be drawn up here, while the negative values will be drawn down there. Will be drawn down there. Good. So having been able to do that, lastly, let us look at the point of inflection. Point of inflection. Point of inflection. And it is also referred to as point of point of contra pleasure. 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 Point of contra pleasure. So this, what is this point? This point is where there is zero bending moment. So the point in the bending moment diagram where there is zero moment, zero bending moment. So the point with zero bending moment. Or it is a point, so if it is like this, and I have my diagram like this, you can see that at this point there is zero bending moment. So that point is a point of inflation or point of contrast, let's do. And on that point is the intersection between the positive and then the negative side of the graph. Good. So having been able to look at all these, let us quickly solve an example on what we have done. And we see how to draw the shear force and the bending moment diagram. And from there, we can bring our lecture to, we can bring our lecture to an end. So let's go to our next slide. Draw the shear force and bending moment diagram for the beam below. So we have been given this beam and we are asked to draw the bending moment and the shear force diagram. Quickly, let's look at how we are going to analyze. Let us use the blank space here. So what we are going to do, we said that the first thing is to draw your free body diagram. So let me draw. Nicely, the free body diagram. So this is the beam. And from the question, this is point is A, and we have a force of five kips. There's also a point here, which is point C where there is a support, so this is a reaction at support. We can call it CY. And the distance between this and that is phi. It's five feet. And the distance between, we also have another point here. Another point here, which is point B. And the force is 10 kips. And there's a reaction of support at B here, which we can refer to, but that one is a thin support. So it has the S component, so Bx, 
and then it also has a y component dy. And the distance from this to that, we are told that it is eight feet. And the one from this point to that point is five feet. So what we need to do is to determine the reactions that support using our equilibrium equations. So from there, we can see that sum of x is equal to zero. And here we only have one x. So we can say that dx will be equal to zero. Then we go to sum of f of y. Sum of f of y is equal to zero. So from here we can say that for f of y, five is coming down, so it's negative. We have negative five. The ten is coming down minus ten. Cy is going up, so plus Cy. Dy is also going up plus dy is equal to zero. And from here we can see that cy plus dy will be equal to positive 15. Then once you are done with that, we can take moments. So sum of moments, we can take moment at C or we can take moment at B. So in this case, we would like to take moment at C. Since this BS is there, we only have one reaction. So we can take moment at C is equal to zero. And when we are taking moment at C is equal to moment at C, then we are going to first of all take our distance here, five kips. This is the force. And this distance, this perpendicular distance to where we are taking our moment is from this point to that point, which is five. So we are going to get five times five. But we check whether it is going to produce clockwise rotation or anti-clockwise rotation. So if I have my structure like this, this is point C, where we are taking the moment and the force is applied here. Now you can see that this force is going to cause this object to rotate this direction, which is anti-clockwise, so it's going to be positive. But when we look at the force 10, it's like this. So these are force 10 kips. Look at where it is applied and where we are taking our moment. So we are taking the moment here and it is applied at this point. So you realize that it is going to rotate it in the clockwise direction, and therefore that is going to be negative. So we have negative 10 times the perpendicular distance, which is horizontal, is a vertical force. And therefore the perpendicular distance is going to be horizontal, which is going to be 8 feet. And then we come to the last force, which is UI. And we have BY times the distance where we are taking our moment, which is 5. This is where we are taking a moment. So 5 plus 8, which will give us 13, is equal to 0. But this VY is it going to be positive or negative. This is our structure. This is where we are taking a moment point C, and VY is applied here. So you see that VY is going to rotate it in this direction, which is anti clockwise. Therefore, it's going to be positive. It's going to be positive. And from there, When we do the analysis, you find out that dy will be equal to 55 over 13. And from there, dy will be equal to 4.23 kips. And in like manner, once you get dy, we can substitute in this equation to get cy. So we can say that cy which is 4.23 4 plus Cy should be equal to 15. Then from here, when you make Cy the subject, you see that Cy will be equal to 10.77 kips. kips. Once you have done that, we session our structure. So we said that you, it has been established that you always start your analysis from the far left. Let that portion be your origin. So I'm drawing my dotted lines down. Let me use a different color. I am drawing my dotted lines down. So from this point, as I move, where I encounter a force, there's a discontinuity. So here I'm encountering the reaction and the support. 
So there's a discontinuity there. Therefore, I draw like that. Then as I move along, I encounter the force then. So there is also a discontinuity at this section. Then as I move along, I encounter BY. So there's also a discontinuity at this section. So, so now what I do is that I have session one, session two, session three to analyze. Therefore, I analyze session one separately, session two separately, and session three separately. What I'm going to do, I draw the free body diagram for session one. The session one will be up to where the force is applied. So the force is not part of it. So the, the session is from A to C, and the force which is at C is not part of it. So we are going to get our structure to be like this. We have 10 chips here. The distance from this to that is 5. This point is point C. Point C. So we have our shear force. We said that always indicate the shear force in the positive direction. Take note of this. Always indicate the shear force in the positive direction and the bending moment also in the positive direction. So from here, the shear force is determined by summing all perpendicular forces. We only have one perpendicular. The shear force is coming down to so negative 10. This n is coming down to so negative 10. The shear force is also coming down to so minus v should be equal to zero. And from there, we can see that v is equal to negative 10 tips. So we have determined the internal shear force. We are left to determine the moment. So from the moment, we can also say that Sum of moment is equal to zero. So this can be called M1. M1 is already there. So we have M1 plus this force is causing a moment. Take note, you will take the moment at where the end of the session. So don't forget that this is our starting point. This is our starting point. So the end of the session is at point C. It's at point C. So point C is where you will take the moment. Take note of that. So M1 plus, then the force is 10, this one is 5. And we have already stated that it will produce an anti-clockwise motion. So we have 10 times 5 to be equal to 0. Sorry, the force there is not 10, the force there is 5. The force there is 5, sorry for that. The force there is five. So we have five times five. So M1 will be equal to 25 kilo newton meter. Or kips, kips per feet, sorry. It's kips for the feet. So we have finished with the force and the, the shear force and the bending moment in session one. We go to session two. We draw our free body diagram. So for session two, we have a force of 10 at this side. Then we have another force CY. So session two ends at D. So we are going to take our structure up to point D. So this is point D. But the force there is no part. So we are going to get this one is CY, which we are told that it is. 10.77 and the distance from this to that is 5 and the one from this to that is 8 distance is 8 and we have our shear force here and our bending movement don't forget that it will always be indicated in the positive direction so M2, from this we can determine V2 and M2 quickly. So from here, we can say that V2 is coming down. So negative V2, negative V2 plus 10, which is minus 10. 10 is coming down. 
So it's going to be minus minus 10. This C, CY is going up. So we have plus CY is 10.77. Is equal to zero, and from there, when you do the math, V2 should be equal to 5.0. Oh, sorry, I'm still using this 10, it's supposed to be 5. It's supposed to be 5, so this is supposed to be 5. So we are going to get 5.77 if for V2. Now we can determine M2, so we take moment. M2 is in the anticlockwise direction, it's positive. This falls to where we are taking the moment is five plus eight, which is 13. And that is going to produce anticlockwise motion, anticlockwise rotation. You can work it out and see. It's anticlockwise, so we have plus five times 13. Then this force here, it's moving upwards. So we are having a force like this. A force like that. And this is where we are taking the moment. So it's going to cause it to move clockwise. So we have minus 10.77 times the distance from this point to that point, which is 8, is equal to 0. And from the M2, will be equal to 21.16 tips per feet. Tips per feet, one six. Then from there, we can say that we can go to session three. This is the end of session three, so we draw our diagram. We have our force of five here, our CY, which is 10.77. We have another 10 here. The distance from this is five. From this to that is eight. From this to that is five. And our shear force always in the positive direction, A3. Our bending moment in the positive direction, M3. So we can say that negative B3 minus Five minus ten plus CY, which is going up ten point seven seven, should be equal to zero. And from there, we can see that B three is equal to four point negative four point two three negative four point two three. So from there, we are left with just the last moment, M3. So the last moment most often is zero. The last moment at the last end there is going to be zero. Take note of that. The moment at the, at the starting point and the moment at the end point are mostly going to be zero. But let us prove and see whether it's true. So we can say that M3, M3 plus five times the distance from this point to that point, which is five plus three plus five, which is going to be 18, 18 plus this anticlockwise minus, so minus CY, which is 10.77. And the distance which is 8 plus 5, 13 plus 10 percent anticlockwise, so 10 times 5 should be equal to 0. And when you do the math, you find out that M3 is equal to 0. So now let's draw our shear force and bending moment diagram. So from here, From here, I can draw, so this is the starting point. 
So we said that the shear force is going to be on the vertical. So this is on the vertical, the shear force. And this is the length up to this point. This is x. Then at the first division, we find out that the shear force was the shear force was negative pi from our first calculation. The first force was negative. The first session had a force of negative five. So this is our negative five we have indicated. We go to our next session. The shear force was five point seven seven, so positive five point seven seven. Positive will be located upwards, negative will be located downwards. So this will be 5.77. So we indicate that on the on our axis for the third session. And the last shear force was 4.23. Four point two three. So our uh, four point two three we can indicate that on our last side at four point two three. So four point two three will be somewhere here. Good. So once you are done with that, it means that this one is a straight line we just join. So negative five is a straight line. Then this is a point of discontinuity. So we move upwards up to going to this point. This is a point of discontinuity. We also come down. We join to this. And we move up like that. And this is our shear force diagram. Now let's draw the pendulum moment diagram. So also this is a starting point. This is the moment. Then this is our axis. So at the first session, our moment was 25, negative 25. So this is negative 25. We indicate that on the first session, negative 25. And in the second session, it was 21.16. So we can indicate 21.16. Then the last session, it was zero. It was zero. So now, take note, the bending moment always starts from zero and ends at zero. So because it's starting from zero, this one will start from here. Then we move to this point, and then we come to this point. And this is our bending moment diagram. Very easy. I hope it can easily be remembered and understood. So with this, this brings us to the end of our lecture. Thank you so much for keeping in touch with us and staying with us up to this time. It has been an awesome time, but if you have any questions, anything you don't understand, you can kindly let us know. Once again, we say thank you so much for watching. Kindly subscribe, like, share, leave your comments and suggestions as well. Good. So thanks for watching. See you once again as we saw more examples on share force and bending moment diagrams. For now, have a blessed day until we meet again. Bye-bye.